Welcome everyone to this week's Insignio Speaker Series. I'm very happy to be joined today on this first speaker, uh, speaker series of 2024 with Ben Hayward. Ben, who is the CEO and one of the founding partners of 24 Asset Management. Ben, thank you for joining us this evening from London. No problem. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So, so Ben, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a bit of background of, of you, the firm, for those of you uh, or, or for those of our listeners that are not familiar. Sure. OK, so um, I, uh, I spent most of my career before I founded the firm at uh, Citigroup in their alternative investment business, um, where I managed four vehicles uh, that were investing in credit. So uh, that was basically uh, financials and global asset-backed securities. Uh, and we ran around $100 billion uh, AUM through, uh, through that team. Uh, I was there for nine years uh, and then left uh, just before the global financial crisis um, and co-founded 24 um, with the six other uh, founding partners. And uh, I, I joined that to run our ABS business, uh, which we grew from, uh, well, obviously from zero AUM when we founded the business, um, up to the largest third party manager in, uh, in Europe. Um, and then in late 2021, um, I stepped away from that role uh, and into the CEO role, which was a remarkably amazing timing um, for <laughs> what's been obviously a very challenging two years running a, running a, right. uh, a fixed income business. But um, I think it's fair to say the environment's changed quite a lot recently. Uh, and so I think sunnier days ahead uh, and more fun to be had. Someone would say you have impeccable timing or... or... <laughs> Or you're a uh, one lucky SOB, as they would say. But you know, so we'll say that you have impeccable timing. Okay. So, so, so Ben, like you said, you 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 sort of uh, you grew up in the fixed income world. Uh, um, that's what you primarily specialize in. Before um, we all know, uh, 2022 was was uh, was a very peculiar year in the fixed income world. Um, really, uh, we hadn't seen a year like that in, 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 in going back 90 something years. Uh, um, tell us a little bit about, um, what made that so particular, I mean, beyond the obvious that, you know, obviously we had the, the, the fastest, most accelerated fed rate hacking cycle we'd seen in over a generation, uh, beyond the obvious, maybe tell us a little bit about where fixed income had come from. Cause it was very expensive going in, right? That's what also people don't. Uh, uh, or people tend to forget, which is, yes, it had a very bad year in 2022, but it was very expensive after what many would say would be a, almost a 40-year bull market in in the space, right? Yeah, absolutely correct. I mean, it, it had been a very, very long, uh, if you look at it on, on that kind of macro scale, it had been a very long bull market, um, punctured um, relatively temporarily a number of times um, by relatively um, idiosyncratic uh, risk events. Um, and, you know, for those uh, of those of us who have been around a while, um, I want to think back to, uh, you know, LTCM, uh, Russia.com, uh, you know, even, even pre then. Um, then typically what happened was the, um, the in the last 20 years or so was that, the you know, the Fed comes and other central banks comes riding to, uh, to the rescue. Um, and certainly since the, the GFC, that's largely been through um, injecting a massive amount of uh, of financing of, of cheap, very cheap uh, financing into the markets via the banking system. Uh, and what you get is a, is a spike in vol uh, and then a very, very quick recovery. And we saw that, you know, just thinking sort of backwards from, from today, we saw that obviously with, uh, with COVID. Um, we saw that with the, um, the uh, European sovereign debt crisis. Uh, we saw it obviously with the, the global financial crisis as well. Um, and so, you, so not only have you had this, um, going into 2007, sort of 30 year bull run in, in fixed income. Uh, you then have a period where that bull run um, is accelerated, but, but yields are massively suppressed by the amount of, uh, of cheap financing that the, the central banks globally are chucking into the system. Right. So, you know, I think for the last 10 years, people have thought about markets being expensive or cheap within what historically would have been a very, very narrow range of, of movement. Um, so by the time we got to uh, to sort of late 21 when uh, inflation data started um, moving upwards. Uh, you know, people's range of expectations of what could actually happen um, had been materially compressed by um, by what they'd experienced over the last 15 years and, and, and as you say, the last 40 years, you know, as well. Right, right. So uh, uh, tell us a little bit about how, how you're seeing the space today. Um, um, we've seen, you know, uh, the 10-year... 
um, went from uh, a 50, the 10 year in the United States went from 50 basis points um, in the depths of the pandemic. Uh, it touched 450 at some point earlier or, or later last year. Uh, um, what do you think about the fixing the rates market now? Let's talk about rates and then maybe we can get into to, to spread product. Um, in terms of rates, um, you know, the market is expecting, you know, roughly 150 boys, uh, 150 basis points of rate cuts from the Fed um, over the next 12 months. The Fed last told you that they were only going to cut 75. Seems to me that a lot of the way that not just the rates market go, but other uh, uh, risk asset classes are going to go depends upon how much of that gap uh, um or what's the gap between what the Fed actually ends up doing versus what the market thinks the Fed's going to do? So maybe a few comments on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, th this is the ideal place to start because um, what are, what all of your clients uh, you know are are thinking about or or their their sort of current frame of reference um, is obviously the last you know two years worth of, of challenging markets, um, and while there have been other smaller drivers of that risk off move the the main driver of that underperformance is the rates market it is what the central banks have, have been doing um and i, I think the, the the really easy comment to make here is that that um that barrier to performance um has gone right you know there there is almost no one who thinks that rates are going up from here and what that means for for investors um is that they are free to earn the yield they expect to earn, right? The the volatility that is that has negatively dragged their total return down um, and has removed the benefit of the yield that that's that's gone now. Okay, so um, I think the when when, when we look forward from here, um, everyone has a view on when rates are going to move and how far they're going to move, and those are the two things: when, when, and how much. Um, and anybody who tells you their high conviction on that. Uh, you know, I just don't believe uh, right. at the moment, um, and and you can you can see that really really clearly um, in the uncertainty quantitatively in the uncertainty that that's out there in in the data. And, and one really really good place to look at is the is the dot plots that the Fed publish. Okay, so they for, for those of, of the listeners who who aren't aware of this, you know, each uh, Fed member publishes their expectation of where Fed fund rates are going to be for the next uh, for the next twelve months and, and a little bit more. Um, and at the moment, there's a 150 basis point range in the dot plots. Yeah. Okay. So these are the guys who make the decision. And if they can't get more crystallized around a direction, around a quantum of that direction, um, than 150 basis points, then anybody else who tells you no, they know what's going to go on, uh, you know, I, I would question their um, credibility, to, to be quite honest. Absolutely. So, so you know, I think there's obviously a lot of, of focus in in the media um, around is it going to be March and what's the probability of it being March um, and how many rate cuts are priced in for for the rest of the year, um, and and I think that that, that when uh, when we are talking to um, investors such as yourselves at the moment and and trying to talk through them to their clients, we would we would want to tell them that that's not the right question to be asking, okay, because. Um, because that is then getting you caught up in the minutiae um, of a of a timing um, uh, of, a, of, a, of a decision based on timing um, and um, and based on what is going to happen with uh, with the Fed fund rates. And now, most of your clients on a long term basis aren't going to be invested in the Fed fund rate. They're going to be invested in the ten years. Is you know that, that's that's the, the point that you picked. Um, you know, maybe in, in the five year, but you know, a lot of fund managers um, you know, are going to be invested in, in the belly of the curve um, and, and, and the long end of the curve. And that doesn't necessarily move with Fed fund rates. You know, there will probably be a bit of a rally, but if you think that, that, um, that the Fed is going to cut six times, you're going to get 150 basis points reduction in, in cash rates. Does that mean the 10 year comes down 150 basis points as well and you make a great capital gain? No, not at all. There's absolutely no guarantee. In fact, with uh, with estimates of where the neutral rate is, you know, where the where the Fed will take interest rates to a to a sort of zero growth level, um, or sorry, to a normalised growth level, that at the moment people expect that to be around three percent. And historically, 
when we don't have markets that are massively distorted by QE, the the, the gap between Fed fund rates and, and the 10 year is around 150 basis points, which actually puts the 10 year at the moment at the same level. So it, it, you know, I think the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of uncertainty um, out there at the moment. But that uncertainty, well, and that's not, and, and that's also to throw in the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty as to where the neutral rate of interest actually is, right? One hundred percent, impossible almost to say beforehand ex ante. Uh, um, many models try to predict it; it's very difficult to predict, and there's certainly a lot of uncertainty as to where it is today, vis-a-vis -vis where it was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? Yeah. So and, and so, I think you know what. What do we know now is the interesting thing. What are we really high conviction around? Well, one, <clears throat> cash, cash rates aren't going to go any higher than they are at the moment, right? No one is is saying that. The Fed's not saying that. No market participants are saying that. The cash rate is going to go down, right? So those two points for investors at the moment, if they are invested in cash or in the very short end of the curve, that's literally saying all the good news for that positioning is out there already. And that is only going to get worse from here. Okay. So I think that is, is really, really key because those are the only things that, that, that everybody is aligned with at the moment. Does that worry you that everyone is aligned in that view that almost no one is talking about um, a, let's say a potential uh, a resurgence or a renewal of of the hiking cycle like does that concern you at all um i think when anybody when whenever everybody we speak to globally is is tilted the same way um then you know you have to question what the implications are for that but i think what makes us quite uh, makes us a bit more sanguine about it is that the way people are deploying their cash with that in mind does mm -hmm. differ um and so you don't have the market very, very heavily tilted with everybody in a very, very tight trade. Um, and, and you can see that because uh, I'm assuming a lot of your clients are still very heavily invested in the short end of the curve, um, you know, in, in cash and you know, six month um, uh, govies. But, um, but that's not where everybody is. You know, we are seeing increasingly um, people starting to deploy um, into um, higher yielding uh, opportunities at, at the moment. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, Ben, let's move a little bit beyond the rate market. Uh, let's talk about spread. Uh, we can we can start off first with the investment grade universe. Uh, um, uh, potentially, let's start with the U.S. one. Um, how do you see that market or that asset class uh, unfolding this year? Um, so I think I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll probably give you some some quite general um, comments, actually, that will cover um, a lot of a lot of credit uh, in in one kind of go because um, while there is a, a sort of differential in in value between um, you know IG versus versus high yield um, and different sort of geographical sectors, I think the the sort of top down view is is you know, broadly similar. Um, so one is that um, is that yields on an absolute basis are attractive, but in some sectors um, credit spreads. So what you're getting over the risk free rate. Um, is starting to look a bit more expensive, um, and uh, and you know IG certainly um, drops into that camp, um, and US high yield I would say also kind of drops into into that camp as well, um, mm -hmm. and you know I think a lot of that is because um, when we look at the the US economy and US corporate reporting, um, the results still look very strong. You know the the um, the data supports continues to support at the moment the idea of a soft landing, the kind of Goldilocks scenario. And because of that, and because investors are so convinced that the rates are going to get cut, people are buying um, buying yield where they can find it. And that has compressed the opportunity in, in some of that space. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other sort of house views from 24 that you'd like to share with us? Well, I think the... the yeah, yeah, there probably are a couple. I mean, certainly in, in terms of positioning, you know, as a result of that, um, you know, we would be um, favouring uh, you know a couple of parts of global fixed income over um, over the US at the moment because there is a, there is more value there, um, and uh, and certainly um, we we would include in that 
um, financials, principally European financials, because um, their uh, their core equity tier one ratio um, is way way higher than the regulatory minimums, like you know, way beyond what they what they need to hold at the moment. Um, then in interest and margin, their um, non performing loan uh, statistics are, are are very very good. Um, you know, we haven't had the same that we haven't seen the same issues in that market that we have done in in the US regional banking market. And I, I still don't think um, that those issues are fully solved. And actually, I think that does then create a, a, a sort of a flashing red light for um, large swathes of the US uh, commercial real estate market as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we like European banks um, on an absolute basis. We definitely like them um, on a comparable basis to um, to, to US banks. Um, and principally, we like them at the at the um, additional tier one uh, level. Okay. Um, the other part of the marketplace that we think is fundamentally very cheap as well um, is uh, is European CLOs. Um, obviously, there's a there's a big US CLO market. The European CLO market is broadly similar. Um, it's more diversified geographically. Obviously, it's investing across um, different countries rather than uh, rather than one um, you know, big economy. Um, but it, they broadly work the same way. But the yields on offer there. Um, are fantastic. We're talking um, into uh, into um, mid um, teens um, available on rated debt. So those are the two parts of the market that we really like at the moment. I think um, they are not low beta parts of the marketplace. Um, and so you know our house view on um, on where the economy evolves to is a little bit more bearish than uh, than the market average. So this mm -hmm. Goldilocks soft landing, we don't think will actually happen. We think we will get a pretty pretty shallow recession, the kind of thing that, that we talk about on this kind of call, but that actually doesn't really materially impact Main Street. Um, but in that environment, I think we want to be um, improving our credit quality. So then mm -hmm. we look at, at sort of higher beta assets like 81s and CLOs, and we say they're fundamentally cheap. So we want to keep holding those. But if we look at, um, at how we take beta out of our portfolio to prepare for that kind of um, evolution, uh, then we've been materially cutting um, both European and US high yield, um, which again are kind of higher beta parts of the sector. So and, and, to, and we've been deploying um, that that cash then into the US Treasury market to get a bit of um, a, a, a relatively chunky liquidity bucket built up and something that has some naturally protective characteristics if we do see um, the market realizing it's overpriced the the Goldilocks scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, we we had a we we had a research call this morning. We were discussing um, earnings so far, the earnings picture so far, and uh, um, uh, we specifically got into the conversation of the banks and the U.S. banks and how everyone's focused on how well J.P. Morgan did, how well Goldman did, but if you look at everyone else, they didn't really do so well. Earnings are not are not coming in very strong in most banks. They just came in strong enough, one or two banks. Are you any concerned um, that some of these, it, it sounds to me, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds to me like you're perhaps a bit more concerned about uh, 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 U.S. banks than the market is, generally speaking. Um, yes, we are, but but not really about the the big banks. Uh, to be quite honest, um, you know right. this is a, uh, a a regional banking issue, mm -hmm. um, and so you, you know, think that those concerns from last year will flare up again at some point. I, I think there's a there's a good chance that isn't being priced into the market properly. If that's the case, um, yeah. and um, you know our, our our sort of core thesis is that creates vol, but it doesn't create a a credit crunch of of any sort. Um, and I think you know. Savvy uh, CEOs like Jamie Dimon, for example, typically see that as quite a good opportunity. You know, he's not allowed to increase his deposit ratio anymore. He he, he can't, but uh, but unless he he needs to go and bail out a an institution that's a deposit holder. So um, so I, I think this is definitely a regional bank issue. But the reason I, I link that to a commercial real estate um, issue as well is that the proportion of US CRE that's that's funded by the regional banks has massively increased over the last five years, um, which in and of itself wouldn't be a problem. But there is a big refinancing wall coming up in, in that part of the marketplace. And um, and if all the lenders in that space or the majority of the lenders in that space are capital light and their cost of funding has gone through the roof um, and the underlying asset i.e. commercial property has gone down in value because interest rates have gone up so much, 
you've kind of got that perfect storm for um, a, a banking problem to uh, to become a, a CRE problem as well. Okay. Okay. And I'd like to remind everyone that if you do have questions for Ben, please submit them in the chat. Um, I'd be more than happy to share to share them with him uh, uh, right before we finish here in just a few minutes. Ben, let me ask you, uh, um, before we move on to perhaps geopolitical concerns, the elections everyone's sort of talking about, let's talk about uh, perhaps the most unloved part of the world right now. Uh, uh, the Chinese equity market. I know that the 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 fixed income space is your domain, uh, uh, but do you or Twenty Four have any sort of house views on on China, whether it be the economy, the bond market there, uh, uh, the equity market, any sort of uh, uh, um, asset class in the country? Um, so, so we don't invest in uh, in EM really um, at all. Uh, you know, even on the bond side. Um, so our, our colleagues at Von Tobel, who own 24, um, you know, they have a, a burgeoning um, EM equity business and an EM debt business. Um, so I think the uh, the safest thing for me to say is, uh, is is I don't have a view because I genuinely don't have a view. Right, uh, right, right, right. You know, the I think the one thing, the one comment to make um, that has scared us pretty pretty consistently over the last couple of years is the amount of interference um, that. Uh, corporates are getting in China from the government, um, and it's obviously impacted, um, uh, you know, education, uh, in particular with online training, and it's impacted the real estate marketplace. And I think that just creates, um, you know, a, a pretty material risk for everyone, no matter where you are in the cap structure, whether you're equity or, or you know, a senior lender. Um, so, um, uh, so, so no, no massive insights um, other than. Uh, you know, if I was there, then I would be sort of slightly concerned and, and probably looking at X China. Right. Uh, let me ask you this: then. any other developed markets? We've talked a little bit, or we've talked a lot about the U.S. We've mentioned uh, Europe a bit. Any any other developed markets that you are uh, oh, seeing opportunities in, or that you are invested in? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it depends whether you you include UK as part of Europe, um, and that's not a yeah, that's not a sort of political joke. Um, I was going to say that's a very charged uh, political joke, there, Ben. <laughs> yeah, no, well, quite possibly. Um, you know, the, the do you consider the UK part of part of Europe? How about that? I'll tell you. Uh, I mean, geographically and from my holiday plans, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> uh, but but you know, not from a a political point of view and. Um, you know, it, it obviously is very closely tied still on, a, on an economic basis. Uh, they are our main trade partner. Um, but I think, you know, within, within the UK, um, when, we, uh, when we compare the UK, um, even with Europe, even with our sort of closest, closest peer, um, there is still a, a yield premium a, and a spread premium that has resulted from, from Brexit. Um, and that is way overpriced. Um, so you know, that does create a massive, uh, well, a massive, a very significant investment opportunity. Now, you know, when when we look at our portfolios, we are in particular um, strategic income, which I think you know, um, we are um, relatively, you know, evenly allocated across the US, Europe, um, and uh, and the UK. Um, so, so you know, don't get the idea we're we're sort of plunging in there. Um, but I think that that on a relative value basis, you know, there are some excellent opportunities in the UK, um, and that's just because investors have you know, repatriated some of their cash um, and and created a uh, a yield premium. But you know, the easy kind of comparisons to make are are banks. Um, you know, you can look at the amount of CT one ratio, you can look at their uh, their book performance, and you can look at the the yield you're getting uh, between those markets, and and it is still. Uh, it's still mispriced and, and very attractive. Right, right. Okay. Um, great, Ben. So let me go to a few questions that I do see here. One question that I am seeing is, is uh, um, what's your view on the Bank of Japan and which way is, uh, uh, are they headed? Like, are they going to be raising rates when everyone else is cutting? Um, uh, you know, if there is, if there is the right environment for them to be forced to, to do that. Um, you know, I think, that generally central bankers, um, you know, they, they don't coordinate their behavior, but I think it's a lot easier if, if you know, they are moving in the same kind of directions. Um, you know, it creates less volatility for a, for a single geography, but, you know, they will need to be in an environment where um, they are under, um, you know, pressure um, to be doing that. Now, to a certain extent, that pressure is, um, is 
evident in the fact that they are so divorced from where the other um, rate environments are. Um, so, you know, is it is it a problem for them to be um, hiking while the others are cutting, you know, if they're going to end in, in the same kind of spot? Um, but um, uh, I, th I think, you know, we, we need to see how the economic fundamentals for all the central banks um, evolve over the next 12 months to, to actually get more of a flavour for what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. They, they I think notably, they are they are continuing to be quite guarded. Um, and once markets move too quickly on a, on a, in a single direction on an expectation of something that they can't guarantee, um, you know, then then try and walk back the market a little bit with with comments. Right, right. Uh, question here: What is the strategic income uh, portfolio yielding at the time or at the moment? Uh, the, the gross yield on the portfolio is around eight and a half percent at the moment. I think to be specific, I think it's eight forty six uh, today in in US dollars. In USD, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then, so that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say so. Um, you know that that does reflect relatively conservative positioning at the moment. Um, you know, while we are um, bullish on credit um, and um, and don't see you know, a credit crunch coming along, um, and you know, we do think that the market is um, is right in the direction of rate travel. So all the good things are, are there in in place at the moment. Um, you know, there are. Um, there, as I said before, there's a bit of a risk that some parts of the market are overpriced and we might see a bit of a backup on, on a short short term basis. Um, but also, if if our core scenario does play out, um, that there is a technical recession, um, then what we might well see um, as a result is that uh, the Fed cuts rates, um, maybe not a long way, but does cut rates and we get a bit of a, um, a rally in treasuries. Um, and at the same time, we might get a bit of an overreaction in credit spreads. Um, and then what we really want is um, the beta being um, dampened by our UST holdings. Um, and then we access the liquidity by selling those USTs and we go and buy the um, the too cheap credit that's out there in the marketplace. Right. Um, that, that's a very simplified um, you know, explanation of what we would do. But I think the comment is that 8.5% um, could be more. And I think... But I think um, just explaining what we expect returns to look like this year, um, you know, we um, we would expect with that with that big barrier to absolute return performance over the last two years, i.e., rate hikes, with that being taken off the table, um, that investors, whatever kind of strategy they're investing in in fixed income, um, should be expecting to earn the yield uh, on the portfolio when they buy it, um, and there are good opportunities for capital gains on top of that. So you can read into the into my eight and a half percent where you think our total return is going to be for the year. Excellent, excellent, great. And then uh, Ben, final question here because we're unfortunately we're running out of time. Uh, what is the most powerful message you can give clients regarding the importance of moving out of cash and short-term government markets? Um, so uh, uh, this is probably a couple of points here, right? So, so one is. Um, that clients' frame of, of reference for investing at the moment has become massively compressed because they're thinking about two years' worth of pain and they're investing short-term and they're thinking forward maybe three months or, or six months. But these are people typically who normally have a 20-year history of investing and their financial goals are 5, 10, 15 years, right? Um, and investing on a short-term basis massively skews um, your, your total return because it's, then it comes down to timing. And I'm telling you, as someone who's in the markets every day, I don't know what's going to happen day to day, week to week, right? So, so trying to time markets is incredibly bad. The mm -hmm. question they should be asking themselves is, what are my financial goals? Do the yields on offer at the moment help me achieve those um, on a three-year or five-year basis? And if so, what am I waiting for? Because... What we know is that there is obviously a massive amount of cash on the sidelines from from up from what we are talking about clients from from Asia to the US um, on this topic. They're saying the cash levels or short term going bonds around forty percent. When that money starts moving into the bond market, we are going to get a a, um, a sharp, a quick rally and a powerful rally. And we saw the first sign of that in November, December last year, and things moved a long way quite quickly. We've all seen a bit of a backup this year. So 
if you've got a client who's sitting on 40%, they want to hit a sort of a 30% return target over the next three years, they can do that in fixed income. But if they don't commit to it now, when they can lock in that yield, and they think they're going to time it, that's a that's a terrible short term decision. Yep, fully agree with you. Market timing does not work. Uh, it's, it's been proven time and time again. So uh, there's there's a there's a plethora of academic literature out there on the subject. So I, I invite you all who have the opposite view to take a look at it. I'm sure your minds will be changed rather quickly. Ben, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. I know that it is late in London, so. Uh, it's probably what it's uh, it's nine thirty three. Is that right? Uh, it is nine thirty three. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go and help my son with his economics homework. <laughs> Excellent. Funny enough, it, funny enough, it's on inflation. <laughs> that should be fun. Uh, sorry, sorry for you. You spent thirty minutes talking to us about it. Now you have to go. Uh, Not at all. Done. Not so, at all. It was great to uh, great to talk to you guys. Excellent. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Insignia Financial Group LLC comprises a number of operating businesses engaged in the offering of brokerage and advisory products and services in various jurisdictions, principally in Latin America. Brokerage products and services are offered through Insignia International Financial Services LLC, headquartered in Puerto Rico, and through Insignia Securities LLC, headquartered in Miami. Both are members of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, and Securities Investors Protection Corporation, CIPIC. Investment advisory products and services are offered through Insignia Advisory Services, LLC, an investment advisor registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. In Uruguay, advisory services are offered through Insignia International Asesores de Inversión Uruguay, SA, Insignia Asesores de Inversión LATAM, SRL, and Insignia Asesores de Inversión de Uruguay, SRL, in Argentina, and through Insignia Argentina, SAU, and in Chile through Insignia Asesorías Financieras, SPA. Collectively, these eight operating businesses make up Insignio Financial Group. To learn more about the broker-dealers, including their conflicts of interest and compensation practices, please go to https colon forward slash forward slash insignio.com forward slash disclosures forward slash or via www.finra.org. To learn about Insignio Advisory Services and any conflicts related to its advisory services, please see its form ADV and brochure, which can be found at, in at investment public Advisor Public Disclosures website, https colon forward slash forward slash advisorinfo.sec.gov forward slash.